Hey, good morning, Legacy Christian Church. My name is Zach. I am the campus pastor at the Lee Summit Campus, and I'm just thrilled to have the opportunity to dive into God's Word this morning. Uh, as we continue our Protégé series in, in 1 Timothy, we're going to be in chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. But as we begin today, I've been thinking about this subtle lie that I believe we may have bought in the American church context. And I think this lie, it needs to be confronted with the biblical text this morning. It's a lie that has been propagated through a variety of Christian church traditions in the American culture. And it's the lie that you can be a Christian without practicing Christianity. Let me explain what I mean. I've been married for five years in September, so naturally I know everything about marriage, right? No, I'm just kidding. But I, I have learned some things, and some of the things that I've learned are that relational forming rhythms matter. What I mean is dinner with my wife, where we put our phones away and we sit across the table face to face, have made our relationship stronger. Taking our fur baby, Oakley, our golden doodle, on long walks in the evening where we share about our day, that's made our relationship stronger. I even believe exchanging gifts and, and investing time and money to create experiences and rituals and celebrations with my wife in our marriage. Marriage, that's, that's made our relationship and our marriage foundation stronger. So how do you think it would go if today, after service, I went up to Reagan, my wife, and I said, babe, I just I have this conviction, and I think our relationship is stronger than we think. I think that we don't need to really do dinner together every night anymore. In fact, I think it'd be okay if I watched my Netflix show while you ate dinner at the counter every once in a while. In fact, I've been looking at our budget, and I just think that we don't need to spend as much money investing in us. I don't think we need to vacation as much together anymore because our relationship, it, it's strong now. How do you think it would go if every anniversary, every Christmas, every Valentine's Day, babe, we don't need to spend money on exchanging gifts or creating experiences for us anymore because our relationship can take it. You don't, I don't need to go to Trader Joe's to get the dark chocolate peanut butter cups and a flower that you like every time I mess up, okay, babe? I just don't think that would work. You see, when we neglect relational forming rhythms, our relationships, they become damaged or eliminated altogether. Church, you cannot be a Christian without practicing Christianity. In other words, and this is, this is what I grew up hearing, this is the trendy slogan that I think really uh, tried to trap me in my spiritual journey. It's that you can choose a relationship over a religion. You see, relationship and religion, they cannot be divorced. Religion and the rhythms that come with religion are the vehicle that takes us to a strong relationship with Jesus. And this idea that these two things must be married together is, is what we're talking about today. The, the word in the Greek is eusebia. And I believe it's, it's translated in your Bibles as godliness all throughout 1 Timothy, all throughout Scripture. And godliness is the mystery of right belief and right living. It's the paradoxical mystery of the spirit that there's, there's more to the physical, there's more beyond, there's, there's realities of the spiritual realm that satisfy our soul, yet maintaining that we are bodies, that our physical posture and physical rhythms, what we eat, how we pray, when we lift our hands and sing, it, it does something. And we must marry the, the spirit and the flesh. It's the marriage between relationship and religion. All these things go together. And this idea, this Christian virtue, this Christian duty, what Paul is talking about, this virtue that marks us distinctive as, as Christians, that helps us pursue peace in Jesus Christ. It's this. Here's the grand idea of today. Christian piety, Christian duty, godliness, is a path to peace. 
So here we go. That's what we're discovering. And we're going to jump right into 1 Timothy 6 this morning. It says this, Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit, benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Teach and urge these things. Church, the first thing we discover is that Christian piety, the Christian duty, the Christian way of life is practicing contentment under authority. Now, you know what? The Bible has a lot to say about those who wield authority, those who have power and privilege in society. In fact, last month I got to preach a sermon on servant leadership, authentic leadership, that regardless of your position and status, we're to take on as Christians and be servant leaders. We need to do that. And if you have power and responsibility, you need to do that. But here, our text today is talking about how we behave under authoritarian structures, how we behave in hierarchies. Now, you know what? There's a dark past to Christian history. There's a dark past to our country. In fact, there were people, there were influencers who used Bible verses like this one to support disgusting and inhumane racial slavery systems in America just 200 years ago. That's embarrassing. And today, that's not what we're doing. But at the same time, we have a countercultural pill that we have to swallow because what Paul says here, when he uses the word bondservant, the Greek word is doulos. This is best translated slave. He's not, he's not discombobulating the slave system. Christian slaves, they weren't instructed to take measures to change their position or status in the socioeconomic or social totem pole. In fact, whether their masters were pagans, bad people abusing their power, or Christians, they were to be good workers so that everyone saw their unique effort and attitude. And a lot of times it was this unique effort and attitude, even amid suffering, that would quietly convert other people around them to this Christian way of life. We live in a culture that says equity is an ultimate ethic. We have bad definitions of justice that says we're to pursue equity regardless of what authoritarian structures, what institutions, and what people and leaders say. But this is countercultural to the kingdom. Equity is just not a kingdom attitude or value. It's actually the antithesis because it can ignore Christian virtue and contentment and tries to escape what is sometimes necessary forms of suffering that form us for kingdom work. And we see this all over the Bible. We see this in Moses' life. You think about him. He was in a horrible economic, cultural system in Egypt where, where they were constantly oppressing the Hebrew people, hitting them with whips and making them do impossible tasks. But Moses didn't lead a rebellion. In fact, he ran away just like our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. He fleed to the wilderness and he suffered in the wilderness till the God of justice sent him back and brought justice. Now, at the same time, Moses wouldn't lead a rebellion, but Moses would lead an exodus to a new and greater kingdom. I mean, it's not just Mo Moses, it's David. You think about David, he had the opportunity to begin instituting a more godly kingdom when he was confronted with the opportunity to kill Saul and take his kingship in Israel. Yet David elected to continue living in caves rather than the palace, recognizing the sovereignty of God and that justice belongs to the Lord. And then Jesus, he wouldn't lead a rebellion. He would disappoint a lot of people. 
He would go to the wilderness and suffer and pray and fast and walk pious paths to, to gain the physical and emotional and spiritual fortitude to go and win us back on a cross, not through a war, but through death and suffering. You know, I love the movies where the hero throws off the oppressive chains of the culture and establishes a new and better way to life. I love it. I love it when Captain America goes rogue. I love it when Han Solo, a rebel, goes against the empire. I love it when Mel Gibson waves the American flag in front of the British. And you know what? I think there's times for civil disobedience. I think there's times for reform. I think there's even times for war to fight true injustice. But perhaps Christian piety asks us to exchange activism and reform for our own rugged cross of suffering. Now, I'm not going to dare leap into every application of our complex culture that our church finds themselves in today. But here's what I know. Before we jump into social media wars and before we jump into making authoritarian agencies feel miserable as Christians, we should slow down and seek spiritual discernment and do our absolute best to demonstrate contentment where we find ourselves. And this is tough. And a lot of times this means suffering, but the pious path of suffering is often one that leads to uncommon peace that surpasses the understanding and logic of this world. This uncommon life, it continues in verse 3. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, Christian piety, this way of life, he, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy and dissension and slander and evil suspicions. And constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of truth. Imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Christian piety means practicing contentment in our holy scriptures. Paul is reminding Timothy that truth-telling is hard and unpopular. You know, biblical preaching, it's not popular because it constantly confronts bad thinking and sinful living. But you know what? There's going to be people who come along and they try to discombobulate your worldview by telling you half-truths. They'll come along and just like the serpent in the garden in the garden of Eden, they'll say, does God really say? And they'll distort and twist scriptures. And if we're going to be Christians that practice Christian piety, we have to know the difference between truly pious teachers and those who are simply propagating heresy. And this begins with knowing the word, truly knowing the word. You know, Legacy Christian Church, we, we value the Word of God, biblical community that lives the Word. You find us week in and week out. We're doing verse-by-verse verse Bible study. I mean, we've been in Timothy for a while now. And this isn't just a value for our adults. This is a value for all the generations. In fact, if you were paying attention, you, you saw the announcement and you saw last week 34 first grade students participate in our Legacy Landmark, the sword ceremony. I mean, that's just, that's an incredible thing. In fact, I got a picture of one. Her name is Emmy Jo Studite. Throw her up on screen. And she got on screen because she's my niece and she's cute and adorable and I'm biased. But Emmy Jo had this experience where she was gifted a Bible and she's going to go on living her life with a biblically grounded trajectory for her life. That's amazing. 
In fact, at the Lee Summit campus, our, our family pastor, Blake Barnhart, he got to be a part of a family meal after church. And there's some pictures of him at the table with his family. And Blake was telling me there wasn't a dry eye at the table in church. Right now, I'm just telling you that the next generation at Legacy Christian Church is going to be stronger than the last because they know the word. And we got to know the word, too. And that's one part of it. But the other part is, is teaching the next generation how to identify people who are going to twist things. And here's what I know. I don't think there's more heresy today in our era and time, but everyone has a platform. And so we see more heretical Christian ideas being propagated both knowingly and maybe more often unknowingly. Not everyone should teach. Not everyone should have a Facebook share or a retweet button on their social media platforms right now. But we want to be able to share. And because we want to be able to share, we need to learn how to identify these heresies. So here are three criteria that help us identify people who don't revere and find their contentment in the Holy Scriptures. Number one, these people, their teachings, they're going to be conceited. Scripture says they're going to be puffed up with conceit and understand nothing. You know, the job of the preacher is to magnify Christ. And we do this in a lot of different ways. You know, we have collaborative teams that, that speak into the teaching and the worship experience. And we're trying to reveal Christ using rhetoric and imagery and stories and testimonies and creativity. And when we do that, we try to build a bridge from the ancient word, the ancient world of the Bible. And we build a bridge to our contemporary minds so that right here in this era, Christ can be magnified. That's what we're trying to do. But church, you need to watch out for people who fall in love with maybe the process and their themselves and their creative abilities and their cleverness rather than the majesty of Christ and the triune God. People are going to be conceited. You need to watch out for conceit. Number two, there's going to be controversy and chaos in these teachers. Craving for controversy and constant friction. You know, preachers who hunger for conflict, they're dangerous. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a healthy conflict and tension whenever you start to embark on biblical preaching. Because here's what happens. You come to service you, you come to the church and you have this worldview, you bring a lot of things, you bring a lot of past experiences and a lot of past teaching with you, and then you go to the Bible and you see that those things don't align. And when that happens, you have to deconstruct what you knew and realign your new worldview with God's word. That happens all the time in biblical preaching, deconstruction and then reconstruction according to the word of God. But false teachers, they use all sorts of rhetoric, and often what they do is they bypass your thoughts to your carnal nature and emotions, and then they leverage those things to create conflict. They point at things that you don't have. They highlight every inequity they can find. They say, look, look over here. You see this with kids. So kids will be like, look, you see that guy at the table? They've got orange juice. I mean, orange juice, that delicious, good Florida natural orange juice. And you're over here with an apple juice bottle. That's not right. That's an injustice. We got, a, we got preschoolers leading an uprising because someone has orange juice and not everyone has apple juice. We got to fix this injustice. But it happens all the time with adults too, right? Look at them. They earn a higher wage. They earn a higher wage than you. That's not right. But forget about the things that the, the jobs are totally different. We need equity in this area of life. The only logical explanation is a systemic evil. We have to pursue justice and make this equal. You know, this happened in Bible times too. In fact, Jesus' disciples fell into this comparative trap. And you know what Jesus said to them? He said, what is that to you? You follow me. 
You know, when we fall into the comparative trap, Jesus is saying the same things to us. We're to be practicing contentment right where we are. It's hard to be content in Christ when your eyes are in different places. Paul's teachers, they're going to stir up controversy. And they, they do it another way. They do it for false, presumptuous arguments. They, they, they build false, slanderous narratives that create people jumping to conclusions. I mean, you, you could hear it this week. I don't know. Maybe someone's going to go, did you hear what that Lee Summit campus pastor preached today? Did you hear what he said about the orange juice? Yeah, that was just an illustration to point out some things. We said, no, that was not an illustration. That was a reality. In fact, I know a small group at Lee Summit Campus. They like orange juice. They opt for orange juice instead of Zach's coffee. And Zach's trying to get them to embrace Folger's coffee and instead of the orange juice. In fact, Zach is alienating these people at the church who are drinking orange juice. He's trying to root them out. And we need to bring justice on the situation. And it, church... Come on, don't jump to conclusions, but give people the benefit of the doubt. We got to give people the benefit of the doubt. Or otherwise, false teachers, what they're going to do is they're just going to manufacture tribalism. And Satan's so good at this. He's been doing this all over in our, our world. He feeds tribes justifications for their way of life. He creates echo chambers for these tribes. And we see it everywhere. We've got maskers and people who don't want to wear masks. We got vaccines and anti-vaccines. We got Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, black, white, and church. We just got to stop participating in some of this stuff because any tribe that you find yourself a part of, any citizenship that you have in this world, it must be subordinated to your kingdom citizenship. And when we fight publicly about theological conclusions and trivial manners, publicly we're hurting the kingdom. Jesus' last prayer in the garden in John 17, he said, Those who would believe in me through my word, Father, I pray that they might be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. We have this uncommon unity that I pray that the people, the Christians at Legacy Christian Church, that they may be in us so that the world might believe that this Christian thing is for real and that you have sent me, Father. Do you know what our number one evangelistic tool is? It's not your testimony. Your number one evangelistic tool is not the next Legacy Christian Church event. Your number one evangelistic tool is Christian unity. And when you propagate ideas and conclusions that divide the body in public places, you're opposing the kingdom of God. And we've got to stop that, church. Because these teachers, the, these people propagating these false narratives, they build insidious loyalty, and eventually they just commercialize it so that they can make a profit. Commerce. See false teachers participating in commerce, imagining that godliness is a, a means of gain. Church, I would be incredibly careful of any thought leader, news figure, social media personality that is selling you a brand. And you know what? I see this in popular culture, but I see it in the, the scholarly world that I live in seminary. We got to be careful. And the other side of this is not every brand is a negative brand. In fact, I know Pastor John Piper's desiring God brand. That's, that's something that, that changed me. It emphasized some theological doctrines that really challenged me, and it helped me grow spiritually in some formative years. Uh, you got a Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University that points people to biblical proverbs and how to manage money so you could have more margin in your life to bless other people. But here's the deal. If you find someone whose brand means material gain, rather than pointing you to Jesus in his ways, if you find somebody who points to you elevating your self-esteem or personal authenticity rather than your desperate need for transformation in Christ, you need to run because you might 
be becoming part of a business plan that opposes God and his kingdom. We need to walk this pious pious path of peace where we revere and find contentment in the Holy Scriptures. We finish our passage today. Verse 6 continues. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pangs. Church, we discover that Christian piety means finding contentment, practicing contentment in God's presence. Or excuse me, in God's provision and what God is doing. Scripture leads us to believe that a prerequisite to practicing godly stewardship is remembering where you came from and where you're going. You didn't bring anything into this world with you, and you can't take anything out of it. And while you're here, your appetite and your desire for more cannot be satisfied. You know, you notice it's, it's not wealth that is in itself evil. It's the desire for more because what we find out is once you taste wealth, it doesn't quench your thirst but it often makes you hungrier. So we got to be careful. We got to conquer our desires. That's what Christian piety requires. And it's hard for us because church, we're a church that has much. And just like God said to Cain in the garden, he's saying to us, sin is crouching at your door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it. And you must become its master. We must master our desire for more. But how? Look, whether it be contentment and under authority in these hierarchical systems or or finding contentment in the hard sayings of Scripture and of Christ or, or being content under what God has provided to us, What we discover is that our character and our soul and will and heart, they need to be reshaped so that we can find peace. And so today I want to give you some spiritual rhythms. You know, just like my marriage, my marriage needs rhythms, spiritual, relational, forming rhythms. Our our relationship with Jesus requests some pious spiritual rhythms to help our will be reshaped into Christ's image. So here's the first one. Establish a prayer and fasting rhythm. And it's really interesting. Matthew 6, it says this. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces and their fasting may be seen by others. The the thing I get stuck on there is when you fast. Did you know Jesus expected Christians to participate in regular prayer and fasting? I mean, think about that. How how often do we abstain from food so that we can be reminded that it's not food, but the presence of God that sustains us? And so again, I don't want to be pharisaical, but if this isn't something you're practicing, then I'd encourage you this week, put this spiritual rhythm in play. Look at your calendar. Look at a meal that maybe you're looking forward to, and you're going to say, look at your calendar and say, I'm going to abstain from that lunch. And rather than fill myself with with food, I'm going to fill myself with some scripture reading and some silence and solitude and some prayer and some singing songs of praise or some Bible journaling. I'm going to be filled with the spirit rather than with food. You know, sidebar, some of us, we say, you know, I fast all the time. I give up Netflix. I give up social media. I give up this. I give up that. I give up sweets. And you know what? That's really good abstaining from anything competing for your time and thoughts and attention that's a really good spiritual practice but the bible when it talks about fasting it's specifically talking about food 
abstaining from food because something special, something unique happens in our soul and where our flesh and spirit intersect when we abstain from literal nourishment of the physical and we recognize and we become satisfied and content in the spiritual realities of God. So let's do this. Let's be a church that really prays and fasts. In fact, maybe to just be a catalyst for you, look at September 13th on your calendar. Maybe that's the day, and you can work up to this in a couple weeks, but that day you're going to abstain from food, and and, and you're going to go to your campus prayer meeting at 6 from 7, and you're going to pray with the body, and it's going to be this crazy spiritual reality where we become a praying church. And then maybe after that, you, you reward yourself and you feast with some of your closest friends following prayer. I mean, that would be a good spiritual rhythm. You know, I'm dreaming of a day where people look around our community and they say, that's Legacy Christian Church. That's the church that prays. I think that would be cool. Number two, depending where you are, this might be more difficult, but develop a giving rhythm. Scripture says, Matthew 6, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now listen, some of you, you've been, you've been beat up by the church. You've been scared of the church asking for money. And listen, that's not who Legacy Christian Church is. We believe that God is going to provide for Legacy Christian Church through his people's generosity exactly what our church needs. But Christian piety requires and demands that you learn a giving rhythm for your life, for your own spiritual formation. Your desire for money, it's, it's constantly competing for the throne of your heart. And so you got to learn how to give generously. And you learn the satisfaction that comes with, with investing your finances in the kingdom. I mean, it is cool when you throw your finances in the ring. You throw your heart in the ring. And your heart becomes intertwined with, with Jesus' plan to use the local church to be a light and hope for this world. Now, I can make a strong biblical case that you ought to be tithing to your local church. You know, this spiritual giving rhythm, it was instituted at creation. Jesus was tithing. Paul was tithing. They taught their followers to tithe. Tithing, listen, tithing is by definition just giving 10% of your income to the Lord, of your earnings to the Lord. So, you know, don't go around saying I tithe three, five, eight percent. That that doesn't make sense. That just changes God's word. It's not very good Bible study. But I don't want to get into that argument today. And because of that, I just I just want to say this. I would expect that Jesus would expect that every follower is giving more than 10% to the local church. And then in generosity, they're carving massive amounts of their personal operating budget to, to bless other people and take people to lunch and, and give to other charities and, and nonprofits. I think that's what Christians ought to be doing. I think that's what Jesus would expect us to do. And I know that seems impossible for some of us. So here's the deal. You got to start somewhere. So at lunch or tonight, just go have a conversation and just talk about, you know, how can we begin building these giving muscles so that we can contribute and invest in the kingdom and store treasures for ourselves in heaven. So go to work on establishing a giving rhythm. Last one is this. And this might be even harder than the tithing and the fasting. Develop a Sabbath rhythm. Again, let's not be legalistic. We live in a busy world, and I think this is one of the ancient spiritual paths that maybe we have been neglecting. And just like giving and and someone who isn't given 10, 11, 12 percent to the church, I don't think you can jump into that. I think that 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 would be like going to the gym when you haven't been in two years. And I think Sabbath is the same way. I mean, resting, that's a spiritual muscle that you got to train. But I tell you what, in the busy world that we live in, this is something you and your family desperately need 
Your soul needs this. You know, simply put, Sabbath is uh, six days of work plus one day of rest equals seven days of worship. And, you know, kingdom economics tell, tell us that God can do more with six than you can with seven. And some of us, we got to learn the six days of work thing. We got to go to work because God expects Christians to work hard and take care of ourselves and others. But then he gives us permission to take a rest. So establish a regular weekly resting rhythm for you and your family. Your soul needs this. I mean, plan some activities that rejuvenate you once a week, you and your kids. You're, you're moving from one thing to the next. So just give yourself permission to cut a responsibility, cut an obligation, and rest. And if you're interested in this, I, I got a recommendation for you. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. This is a book that hit me hard uh, by, by a guy named John Mark Comer, who I just think he's rediscovering and teaching some ancient ways of the Bible and of Jesus that would be good for our church family to emulate. But again, go home at lunch or tonight, carve out some intentional rest. Your soul desires it. Listen, church, Christian piety is a path to peace. And I know sometimes peace feels impossible. You navigate the chaos of this world. You bring in so much to our place of worship. And some of us, we've, we've got children and we just, they're not where we want them to be. We've got marriages that feel like they're falling apart. Our families are divided. We're struggling with, with illness and depression and anxiety. I mean, you feel like something has been taken away from you. And you're wondering, how in the world can I experience peace where I am today? And here's what I can guarantee you. The only place that you can truly discover peace is in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Christian piety, this path to peace, it means practicing contentment in Christ. You know, on the other side of these spiritual disciplines, there's been people who have walked the Christian faith and they've participated in prayer and fasting and kneeling and the raising of hands and, and uh, liturgical traditions. And I don't know where you come from, but uh, those, those vehicles, those pious paths, they seem so dry. And a lot of times that's the case because the vehicle of piety was taking you to a destination that was not Jesus Christ our Lord. And so today as we talk about these paths, we want to make sure that we land on Christ. So in this moment, I want to encourage you to take out your communion, your elements. We're going to participate in this, this pious path of communion together as a church family. And as we head into that time, I want to give us a snapshot. I think it tells us a story of maybe where our church is today. In John chapter 6, verse 52, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. You know, it's this moment in Scripture where Jesus is confronting some religious leaders, and he says, your pious works and your pious past, they, they have become inadequate because you think that is going to deal with your sin. Jesus says, there's nothing you can do. It is only me, my flesh, my blood, my life, my work, my cross, and my resurrection that can deal with your sin. And I am the only way that you get to this kingdom table. It was crazy. In that world, it meant a lot of things. It meant a lot of stuff that they had brought 
into the church had to go. It meant their family status, their works, their history. It didn't matter. And it, it leveled the ground between the churchgoer and the prostitute. It was a hard saying in the midst of a chaotic world. In verse 60, when many of the disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? And after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus looked at the 12 and he said, do you want to go away as well? And I believe in our chaotic world with the storms of life that many of us are navigating this morning, Jesus is looking at us in the face and he's saying, do you want to go away as well? And this morning, I hope our church has the courage and the boldness and the faith to echo the words of Simon Peter who said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. <clears throat> the mistake we continually make as Christians is we look for places outside Christ himself for peace. So today, together, let's take the bread and remember that peace can only be found in Christ himself. Let's take the bread together. Let us also take the cup and remember that it is Jesus' work, his blood, that carved out the ultimate path to peace, the path where we can drink at his table this morning. Let's take the cup together. Father God, we sit in your presence this morning at your presence we find peace in knowing that you hold all things together Lord I pray that we would carry this peace and this contentment into our day to day lives so that the world may know that you have sent your son Jesus it's in Jesus name we pray Amen